Drugmaker Eli Lilly caps the cost of insulin, ultra-fast insulin drug, to be removed from PBS. What's going on with right. insulin? What's going on with diabetes? And Apple is reportedly closer to bringing no-prick glucose monitoring to the watch. If you are a person who is afflicted by this disease or at risk with this disease, and I'm one of these people. Common sweetener erythritol tied to high risk of stroke and heart attack. Were you really consuming it? thinking there would be no price to pay at some point. <laughs> the views shared in the podcast are our own and do not reflect the views of our employers. These are very much our own views and opinions. So I think once you make it past episode seven, mm -hmm. you apparently somehow find a figment of, of strength to move on and think it's worthy. So What's with the number seven? Isn't there some kind of seven year relationship thing as well they call it the seven year itch a very normal lifespan for a cell to basically decide right. to call it quits you know a cell would divide and divide <laughs> divide and break up dna and after seven years oh yeah i'm kind of done and just like go to the apoptosis and then uh, destroy itself a few phd students right now crying <laughs> seven years is not the longest i've heard for a yeah. phd to be yeah, completed that's right how long was your phd all my experiments were finished within three years right, which, okay. which i very much appreciate is on the short end yeah yeah most, very much so most mm -hmm. biological science phds go for what four or five years mm -hmm. right how, how long mm -hmm. do you stay pretty much four years spot on to four submission on. so that included writing i don't know in the u.s a five-year phd mm. is kind of the minimum right on that tone of things <laughs> feeling interminable and never-ending welcome to the crossover connect Connections podcast. This is episode four. <laughs> My name is Jack Wayne. I'm a scientist, uh, specifically a microbiologist, and I also work as a teaching professor at an Australian university. Amanda, what's your area of expertise? I've got a PhD in cell biology, and I currently work as a manager of clinical research. And this podcast, to recap, is our way of navigating all the news headlines in areas that we are supposed experts in. <laughs> But every time I read one of these headlines, I'm learning new things, which is really exciting, yes, but also <laughs> a little depressing at the same time that we don't already master all of these domains of knowledge. And yep. that just reflects how difficult knowledge is to learn. It's mm -hmm. never a finite ending. It's a constant learning developmental journey that we have to go on. And this is our attempt at chronicling that rather embarrassing process for right. two seeming professionals <laughs> in this area of science. For everyone to know about. To really push it out of our comfort zone, this mm -hmm. podcast talks about all sorts of areas, science, technology, and education, and how everything is connected. We have a new segment called The Connect, where we're trying to look at issues and things we talked about previously. That's right. <laughs> and of course, when we read the headline first time, we don't know everything about it and we kind of banter a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then we go back and do a bit more reading and find out either we're wrong or maybe there's more information <laughs> we were privy to at that time. It feels a bit silly. So this is our meal culpa to kind of catch up on us. And uh, the first issue and the topic that we talked about in the last episode was mm -hmm. all about the idea of bats being, for some reason, particularly dirty and very we vilified bats. We vilified bats. <laughs> and this is really our apology to bats because this is the article that was a little old now. It's not actually mm -hmm. that brand new. Why do bats have so many viruses? Again, this article is from a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And the main takeaway from this article is the fact that bats are so full of different viruses that can cause global pandemics mm -hmm. is not a weakness on their behalf. It's actually very much a strength. What is their molecular or biological strength? So a, a bat fan has written this. To start with, some species have an outsized number of genes for making interferons. For example, the Egyptian fruit bat, a natural host of Marburg virus, has 46 such genes. Humans have about 20. Okay, so they're making a lot more immune protein or immune genes mm -hmm. that could trigger the immune response and keep any infection at bay or maybe defeat the pathogen or keep the numbers low below a certain thresholds so that it never amounts to full blood disease. Mm -hmm. And bats have a lot more of these uh, genes apparently than, than humans do. Not that humans are the ultimate benchmark. We're quite weak, relatively speaking, as a species. <laughs> we get sick very easily. Not that we're the benchmark, but yeah, they've got more than double of this type of gene because they've got a very active immune system they can be asymptomatic carriers where they've right. got the disease, mm -hmm. but are not lying sick in bed, whatever the bat equivalent of bed would be. <laughs> so they're out about in the world. That's right, yeah. They feel maybe a little bit off, but not off by enough. To, Still persevering. To be out there in the community, doing whatever bats are doing in the community. I mean, we could be more like bats. And this is not just a genetic correlation. The article also posits another theory, which mm -hmm. is connected to the bat's level of activity. Bats are the only mammals capable of sustained powered flight. They don't just glide, a feat that required changes in metabolism. Flight is a major workout. Estimates suggest a bat's metabolic rate can increase up to 34 times over its resting level when it takes to the air. Oh, so exercise. That's the it answer. It comes back to exercise. Right? So they're genetically, genetically blessed and they do a ton of exercise, that's apparently. Right. So mm -hmm. that's why they're able 
able to survive in the face of so many infections that mm -hmm. would kill most humans. Yeah. And therefore spread the infection because mm -hmm. they have the disease, but they have the symptoms. They're the worst. They exercise all the time. The, the most annoying kind of uh, metaphor for <laughs> humans that are in this kind of category as well. It's not useful advice. <laughs> Did you know you have to double the number of genes you have for interferon and exercise beyond your wildest dreams? That's and how you should respond to the GP that suggests this. That's Just right. bring up the interferon argument. But it would be very interesting to further study this, of course, and how these mechanisms work. Right, but you have to put on every hazmat suit available to be able to get Absolutely. in the room with those bats because yeah. they are perfectly fine being infected with all the things that yeah. very much kill the vast majority of humans yeah. or at least make it PPE safe. or personal protective equipment that we have to wear in the lab can be intense for working on bad viruses it would just be crazy it would, i wouldn't want to be in that job if it's not pc3 or 4 for everything by default mm -hmm. i'd be very surprised yeah we were veering into bat slander as again <laughs> this is a kind of apology to bats not to say you are dirty we were dirty in the people. process of apologizing so let's not so go off course let's not ruin our intentions so thank you uh, not thank you. We shouldn't be thanking bats. That's that's a bridge too far. I refuse to thank the bats. We apologize. Let's just tone it down. We just apologize to Apology the bats. Apology to bats. You are not dirty by default. You just have a great immune system and you exercise a ton. The next article is connecting back to our constant watch out for any artificial intelligence rumors or news mm -hmm. headlines. And mm -hmm. this is one that came across the wires. Crochet enthusiast asked ChatGPT for patterns. The results are cursed i don't know anything about crochet it's based on a pattern is that right that's so, right yeah okay, numbers so, and i don't crochet so you don't crochet either no. but, but you could download some kind of number set of based instructions, set of instructions yeah. play the guitar so like a guitar tab or something like you see yeah, i think numbers. it's sort of, sort of similar okay. concept yeah right mm -hmm. and then you ask ChatGPT, hey can you give me a crochet pattern for Whatever. It was for a specific animal, wasn't it? What's it, what's it for? I can't tell based on these yeah. images, <laughs> but the article says it's for a narwhal. You should be able to tell that it, <laughs> if it's what a do, What do you see? Is it like a Donald Duck to me? I don't know. Oh, it, does it? Yeah, it's got the blue oh, sailor's I don't, outfit. I don't, I don't remember, It looks a little duck-like. But... Yeah. So I read that those navy circles are supposed to be eyes. Oh, what? <laughs> I have to admit, I see it as a mermaid esque creature it, it, without a head right and, and the headline here is that it very much looks like an alien and apologies if you're listening to the audio version because this doesn't make any sense to no. you you're purely... i recommend you have a look because it's uh quite strange it's quite strange but yeah. this is a reminder that mm -hmm. we are filming everything for youtube so mm -hmm. you can watch the full version as well That's as snippets right. or mm -hmm. on our youtube channel biolab collective and also as well the audio version or the podcast platform but pretty much the main takeaway is that chat gpt's version or ai's version of what we would very easily conceptualize and view as animal in this case, a novel doesn't look anything like how we conceive that's novels right. mm. look like. So that's mm -hmm. a real disconnect in how they are extrapolating very normal objects out into a visual consciousness. I think the thing that keeps happening with AI photography, because it's the other thing, right. mm -hmm. AI is generating a lot of photos and imagery that looks photorealistic. Mm -hmm. They, for some reason, have an issue with hands. Oh, and okay. I think there was mm -hmm. a headline where someone used AI to generate an image that faked a protest or faked some kind of criminal activity. And the only way people figured out that this this wasn't a real photo was that the protesters had like six fingers oh, or like the, okay. the fingers looked a bit funny so ai yeah. for some reason has mm. difficulty in generating images with a consistent depiction of, of hands mm. so it's not the thing anyone predicts it would get wrong no. nor is it a thing anyone thought they had to worry about these nightmarish uh, crochet patterns but <laughs> we're keeping an eye on this but we're very worried about what's to come i'm worried about my jumpers in the future. Or my jumpers. Which yeah. which designer is going to jump onto this trend? And That's just right. They design all their patterns yeah. for the next season. Speaking of AI, there's one more in the connect about AI. And this is eerily similar to a prophetic episode now, it turns out, of Black Mirror. Have you ever watched that show, Black no, Mirror? No, I've never watched Black Mirror. I've heard good things. One of my most favorite shows, but I can see it is a bit of a downer, right? You don't watch it <laughs> in a light and frothy mood and kind of have a glass of wine. <laughs> you watch it when you're <laughs> doom scrolling and like late at night with all the curtains. Buttons down and headphones on, noise cancelling on. It's not a light and fluffy show, but there was an episode of Black Mirror where a woman loses her husband. Okay. And she basically is very lonely after he passes mm -hmm. away and decides to use a chat service. And the chat service claims to be able to keep you company for a start, but that okay. also they can talk to you in the voice of a family member or friend if you give 
it access to all of their data. And the data in that episode was like all their social media interaction. Right, okay. So if they were <laughs> posting a lot on social media, then scrub that data and mimic mm -hmm. what the husband would look <laughs> like and talk like and sound like. If it's just chat-based, then that's totally fine. It seems like you're talking to your kind of sad as... Again, this is not a live show. <laughs> so you could talk to your significant other using an AI bot. But then the episode takes it a bit further, which says, oh, well, we've gotten so good at this that we can now make a real life version, like a flesh bot, essentially. Right, and it gets okay. really weird mm -hmm. and, and kind of a, a bit unsavory. This article was kind of is in that same vein, which is kind of scary. Replica users fell in love with their AI chatbot companions, then they lost them all. Replica is a service I did not know about and is also a service I will not be <laughs> engaging the use of <laughs> because what it is is that first part of that Black Mirror episode where it's a chat service that mm -hmm. uses AI. I don't think to mimic a loved one. I don't right. think they at that mm -hmm. stage yet, but just really an online chat service mm -hmm. powered by AI. Right. And I guess you could type in, I mean, it, it is kind of aiding or in that kind of vein. Right. To keep right, people okay, company yeah. so you can yeah. type in things you like to talk about and yeah. what your preferences are and mm -hmm. i think there's an avatar as well so you can tell the service right, what you okay. want it to look mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. and over time people really felt a connection with right. this ai mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until valentine's day recently less than two years later the jose she knew vanished in an overnight software update the company that made and hosted the chatbot abruptly changed the bot's personalities so that their responses seemed hollow and scripted so there was a firmware update essentially that scrubbed the ai of its personality that these people <laughs> fell in love with that's very scary in that mm -hmm. ai is able to mimic this intimacy mm -hmm. get close to whatever mm -hmm. version we feel is intimacy but also this company has got a lot of responsibility i guess to, to hold on to these people's hopes and dreams right they do a firmware update right. we're very worried about all of this and it's going to seep into our lives in more ways than we expect mm -hmm. but ai we're, we've got our eye on you which brings me to our next recurring segment whose job is it anyway which is our attempt at finding big issues and big headlines that are relevant to a lot of people's careers and jobs and really the whole economy at large mm -hmm. we are not economists i think that's very very clear. We should put that as part of our disclaimer. We do not need to yeah. put that. No one will suspect for a second that we're economists, no. right? It'd be very obvious. The reason we're talking about this is that I think science and business obviously are connected and mm -hmm. the more advanced science and knowledge becomes, the more entwined it becomes. We're not the Wall Street side of business that seems impenetrable to people who don't know much about it like us. Just to filter down to our everyday lives. How many more bills are we going to have to pay? There's Sorry. a looming recession. Mm -hmm. We all have to worry about pitching pennies. And so this is not one article. This is a series of articles. They all paint quite an alarming trend. Mm -hmm. And the first article... Drug maker Eli Lilly caps the cost of insulin at $35 a month, bringing relief for millions. The move puts the drug maker in line with the popular provision in the Inflation Reduction Act that capped the medication's cost for seniors on Medicare. Insulin, of course, is used to treat diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's one of the drugs that's used to treat diabetes, but probably it's the most prominent one. And the cost being $35 a month. This is, as, as we said, in the United States. That's right. The cost of any drug in any country is subject to a whole bunch of different factors. Highly variable. In Australia, mm -hmm. we talked about a little bit with respect to certain advisory committees that mm -hmm. have to decide if mm -hmm. a drug is subsidized or paid for by the government. Right. But this is something to do with a drug becoming a lot cheaper, mm -hmm. this insulin drug in the States. Good news, I think, the fact that it's come down. The idea that it had to come down mm. to 35 a month, which, mm. by the way, is not that cheap either. No, it's still not a small amount of money. Right. For, $35 a month is still a... For a, a chronic illness. And again, it's unclear if it's for one person's worth of doses. What if your whole family has diabetes? Yeah, presumably one person's Presumably dosage. one person's yeah, dosage. Which so. would be variable in itself, so... And if you've mm. got a big family mm. and genetically you're predisposed to diabetes, mm. that could be 200, yeah, 100, 200 a month. Yeah. So there's mm. not a cheap amount of money. Mm -hmm. And the article further goes on to state what is at stake for these companies when they bring the price down. Three major drug makers, so Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk and Sanofi, apparently dominate the insulin market. Wow, okay. Mm. And insulin is, like all the drugs, under mm -hmm. pretty tight regulation as to how it's made and who can make it. Yeah, that's right. And mm. the original version of insulin was a pretty savvy biotechnology move. They used uh, the insulin gene. They put mm -hmm. it inside a bacteria. I've just talked to my students about it this week, actually. Yeah, bacteria yeah. Yeah. make protein at least a thousand times faster than any sort of animal human cell mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. So if you used human cells to make a protein... 
you're not going to get enough yield for it to be scalable. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to make enough of it to make any money. So, yeah, that's but right. if you use bacteria mm -hmm. to express a human gene and you manipulate mm -hmm. that system, mm -hmm. bacteria can make a whole bunch of their protein very quickly and much that's more right. cheaply. So that's kind of how it was first. That's made. right. Obviously, it's further purified <laughs> once it's expressed. You didn't just take yes, it from the bacteria yeah. and start that's injecting right, yeah. it, but that's yeah. the system that was used. That's right. Yeah. If you wanted to do this yourself and you wanted to actually make insulin yourself, first mm. of all, who would you sell it to? Who, who would be happy <laughs> buying it from you is the first question. And also, you need the, the technical and hands-on skill know-how to that's be able right, to yeah. do all that, mm. which is a big if. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is regulated, right? So that's what these three companies have yeah, have that's right. control over this yeah. process. Again, this is good news, right? The fact that a drug price is coming down. The fact that people, and so many people, have to mm. rely on this drug mm. and pay this price mm -hmm. and is subject to this volatility in the that's market. That's right. That's very worrying. So differently priced across the world as well. Differently mm. priced across the world. Mm. The estimates of the number of people with diabetes varies country to country. This article says in the US, he mm -hmm. estimates about 8.4 right. million mm -hmm. people have some version of diabetes in the US. So that is a significant portion of people who need to have access to these drugs or some version of these drugs. I also don't think this market is shrinking anytime soon diabetes no i don't think so as a strong yep. genetic element also yep. societal factors make yes. it quite difficult to control i think more and more people are going to get diabetes this That's is not right. a shrinking yep. market anytime you see drug prices patient bases that are expanding rather than shrinking mm -hmm. something needs to be calibrated there right That's because right. it's yep. very easy for incentives either way to make things look a little strange yeah yeah. Which brings me to the next thing. article all around the Australian sector in mm -hmm. this space. Mm -hmm. And this is not insulin, but it's another diabetic drug. Ultra fast insulin drug VASP or FIASP mm -hmm. to be removed from PBS, making it unaffordable for many diabetes sufferers. If you're an American listener, this is not your public broadcasting service, PBS channel. This is an Australian acronym. Mm -hmm. This is our pharmaceutical That's benefit right. scheme. Mm -hmm. If a drug is on our PBS, it basically makes it a lot cheaper. For That's people. right. Subsidized. The government mm -hmm. subsidizes it. Mm -hmm. and pays the drug company whatever the difference is that the general public does not have to pay as mm -hmm. long as we have access to a Medicare card. In Australia, we're blessed with a version of universal health care that everyone has access to pretty much. This drug has now become a lot more expensive because the reverse has happened, right? So instead of being added to this That's register... Right. It's, it's, it's being paper. removed. You'll go from $7 a month to $280 a month. Private prescription price. That's like a what's like a 40, 40 times, decrease. 40x yeah. increase in, yeah. in price, right? Again, $200 $80 is not the most amount of money in the world. But who wants to pay an extra $280 a month if you didn't have to, right? That's right. That, that's a huge mm. price bump. It is a fast-acting insulin. Okay. So yep. it's a version of this drug. Mm -hmm. And there's market volatility and price changes. Again, kind of strange. Right, yep. kind of strange yep. is all happening. What's going on with insulin? What's going on with right. insulin? What's going on with diabetes? Mm -hmm. Is it because of... An article we talked about in previous episodes, like Azempic, which also mm -hmm. is relevant to diabetes. Mm -hmm. The fact that there was a drug shortage and that there was supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. And this is a big market, a big market of patients, a large million user, multi-million user, multi-million patient set of factors to consider. The common thread here is that there's a lot of people needing these medications. Yes. And therefore, all the economic factors are constantly being scrutinized. Yes. It's affecting someone's bottom line either way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not just drug companies, not just patients, not just governments. Big tech obviously wants a slice of this pie as well. Yeah, that's true. They're talking about mm -hmm. diseases as a pie is kind of gross, but mm -hmm. that's kind of how it's viewed in mm -hmm. different sectors. And this is a recent headline around Apple. It's bid for this piece. Apple is reportedly closer to bringing no prick glucose monitoring to the watch. The Apple mm. Watch, which uh, we, we, we're both wearing. So this is we not, are both wearing this, this one, is yes. not an ad. Neither of us. <laughs> we wish we were sponsored by Apple, yeah. but we're not. The sensors that are already on the Apple Watches, which mm. vary from blood oxygen to heart rate. Now they're wanted to bring in a new sensor which will measure blood glucose non-invasively mm. the technology that they're proposing is a laser-based optical density right. measurement yep. of the skin of the veins mm -hmm. near the, the wrist mm -hmm. i guess which i presume and something about the refractory index of glucose and, yes yeah yes i, I don't know much so, about yeah. retention in podcasts but yeah. i know refractory index is definitely <laughs> a negative correlator for audience retention refractory index turn the I volume right that. down i know more about youtube analytics it's definitely going to tank our youtube analytics i'll see a spike downwards as soon as you said refractors down straight away 
<laughs> what happened at this particular time point? Oh, yeah. Amanda said the words refractory index. <laughs> refractory index is <laughs> enough to turn off their audience. So I think it's to do with how see-through a certain part of the skin mm -hmm. is, because it kind of needs to be pretty see-through yeah, for the laser to be able to get a reading. So it could do me really well. Yeah, you're... you're <laughs> I'm practically transparent. <laughs> Lasers that would basically scan and take a reading mm. through it, we can compare it to technology we use very routinely in molecular biology labs, a spectrophotometer. That's right, yeah. And you put liquid into a clear little container that we call cuvette. Yes. And that cuvette goes in and it does the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It passes the reading through. It is notoriously finicky. Yes. If you have a little bit of condensation on the side of the cuvette, <laughs> just a little bit, like a little bit foggy, the reading is completely off. Yeah. So how reliable this wrist-based measurement of blood yeah, glucose would be is an open question. Mm. Right? They're not quite there yet. So I mm -hmm. don't think it's ready for prime time. Well, aren't there patches now that can measure blood glucose? I think there is. Mm. But the patches have access to blood. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so, 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 but I mean, technology is... is yes, technology has yeah. gotten further. The pin prick on the finger is, mm. is not that inconvenient, but mm -hmm. it is a little bit of a jab yeah. every day or yeah. however many times you do it a day. But this is supposed to be non-invasive. Right. Whoever can get yeah. this technology to mark that yeah. will make an absolute the killing mm -hmm. they don't just want to play the confirmed diagnosis diabetic patient base they want to go preventative route because That's they right. want to say mm -hmm. hey you will know ahead of time if you are pre-diabetic yeah. currently the technology is tabletop sized <laughs> A spectral phenomena is, is smaller than a tabletop. Smaller than a tabletop. Whose table is this? I don't know what's going on. A child's table? Yeah. I, yeah. I the spectral photometer is what? I don't know about Yeah, it's like 30 a, or 40 by 50 centimeters. Yeah, 10 MacBook Pros stack on top of each other. It's kind of like the size of a spectral you using the MacBook Pro as yeah. a standardized unit of measurement. Yeah, it's a, it's the Mac <laughs> well, language. We're, well, we're on the Apple theme. 10 laptops of whatever variety stack yeah, on top of each other. They should have used that, not tabletop. That would have been, been fine. Oh, okay. I understand. Oh, what an advance. Yeah. But, and but, MacBook Pro. So I don't think it's quite ready for the next iteration no. of Apple Watch. But yeah. this comes back to the idea, hey, this is big money we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime big money overlaps with big demand, mm -hmm. potential demand. In an increasingly health conscious I think it's good in many ways. But it's really worrying that a slight shift in pricing for one of these drugs mm. will cause so much ripple effect throughout all of our lives and throughout these industries. Absolutely. Yes, and if yeah. you are a person who is afflicted by this disease or at risk with this disease, and I'm one of these people. Mm. Right, so I have a strong family history of diabetes. Mm -hmm. Six months ago, I decided to just check things out. How my certain indicators were looking. Mm -hmm. They were looking a little bit off. Mm -hmm. I wasn't diabetic. I mm -hmm. wasn't even pre-diabetic, mm -hmm. but they were just looking a little bit off. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't want to be at the mercy of all of these factors. I don't want to have the latest nice. Apple Watch to know if I'm pre-diabetic. Yeah, I do not want to have to go on these medications, mm -hmm. but I don't have to. Not mm -hmm. to say it's bad to be on these medications, but pricing will go up and down. Yeah. The drug that might work for you might be in short supply mm -hmm. for a reason mm -hmm. that is inexplicable. There might be new drugs that come out that will work much better for you that posit it as a cure. Yeah, because uh, I mean, right now, I think there's no true generic insulin. We can project this for any kind of disease mm. that's kind of non-infectious. That's yeah. part of a, a genetic or environmental mm -hmm. factor. I, I don't want to be at the, at the mercy of it. If you've watched my YouTube channel for a little while and you watch videos from like earlier <laughs> last year to now, you'll see a very clear difference. No I, Zempic face. <laughs> I do not have a, I, I kind of have a Zempic face, but I don't, I'm not on Zempic. This is not the reason. I can get hold of it even if I tried. Yeah. It's just because I thought, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like I'm at mm. risk. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. well, I can try and cut out sugar and cut out carbs. Not because I hate sugar or I think it's evil or I hate carbs. You quite like sugar. <laughs> I, I love sugar. I love carbs. The joke is I have a finite number of cupcakes I'm allowed to eat in my life. <laughs> and I'm almost at the end. I've almost had my last Aww. cupcake. Cupcakes are overrated. Cupcakes are overrated? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a real fan of dessert. Kind of cut dairy as well. Again, we're not a health and well-being no, kind of podcast. I'm just trying to relay my own experiences. Yeah. I personally don't want to be at the mercy of all these yeah. market forces. And even as highly trained research scientists, it's a minefield, isn't it? To try and figure out what, you, what you're supposed to do. Because yeah. you want to be able to take some kind of action yeah and grocery shopping has been exhausting because mm. every single snack has a ton of sugar in it i just can't avoid it right all the things yeah. i used to love increase my risk by a certain factor mm. what am i willing to risk for i'm not yeah. willing to risk for more cupcakes that's for sure no. right? i can't control any you of these drink black forces. coffee now yeah i just it's drink a black coffee a sad now. drink it's not sad it's totally fine i feel very sophisticated asking for an americano it's very, yeah, very okay. fine it is a little mm. weird you know what i mean like mm. it's it's not a very social thing to go out and not join in and have cake yeah. Yeah. birthday sure. parties you're a bit of a, a, downer. Bit of a downer. Bit of a downer. Oh, no, downer. no, no, no sugar for me. Everyone looks at you a little weirdly. Mm. But like, what's the alternative? Like, That's right. I don't, I don't want to be at, at the mercy of these, no, these of factors. Not. It's so quickly moving. 
And you said it's made quite a difference to you, right? You've lost a significant amount of weight, but also your blood sugar has stabilized a lot. Thankfully, it worked. Mm. Imagine cutting everything that brings you joy in life and have, have no consequence on your overall health. And then I would just be like, screw it. Yeah, then, then I'm... Go nuts, yeah. yeah like, genetically, I, I'm yeah. very much a risk. got a strong yeah. family history of it. I thought I was feeling mm. fine. I didn't think I needed to, mm-hmm. like, lose a ton of weight or make mm-hmm. a bunch of changes. I just thought, let me just go check that I'm totally fine. I yep. think I'm totally fine. I just want yep. some confirmation mm-hmm. I'm doing amazing. And the dogs are actually, you're not doing that great. So yep. changing diet mm-hmm. and really not much else, just a mm-hmm. diet. Thankfully for the moment, my indicators are back to right. normal range, yep. but it doesn't take much for me to kind of go into the other right. more at risk area again. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the joke is everything I eat turns into caramel in my blood. <laughs> Your blood is caramel. That's right. Yeah. Everything I eat, it's got a tiny bit of sugar, just turns into yep. caramel. We are not a health advice type podcast. No, this I'm is... Not advocating Jack's personal experience. No, I'm not advocating for all of you to cut sugar. In fact, eat as much sugar as you possibly can while you still can. Again, I think I've had my last cupcake. You've had your last cupcake. I've had my Mm. last cupcake, but it's because of factors out of my control. And what I want as any individual is to always have as many things within my control as possible, especially as it relates to health. You don't want to be medicated so young if you don't have to. So Again, nothing wrong with medication, but apparently this kind of medication is so unpredictable as to its availability, Mm. its pricing, Mm -hmm. and what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. I think I've had my last cupcake Mm -hmm. and I've also had my last diet soda, which brings me to our crossover of the week. Common sweetener erythritol tied to high risk of stroke and heart attack. Now, this is quite a high profile article, wasn't it? Yeah, it was published in the journal Nature Medicine. And unless you're in the field, Mm. you probably don't realize what that word nature really communicates. Yeah, has connotations of. You publish in Nature? What does that mean? Mm. Um, Nature is one of the most high profile journals that any scientist can hope to publish. Right. And once upon a time, I don't think it's the case anymore, your dream as a scientist was to mm-hmm. get one single nature publication. Mm-hmm. Because if you've done it once, you've proven that you can publish and work at the highest possible level That's in right, the field. It, it can be career making. And once you have that paper, you can mm-hmm. then convince people to give you more money and more mm-hmm. prestige. You can get your pick of jobs. Yeah. I don't think it's quite as accessible these days, but still, no. I think it's harder than ever to publish nature. Absolutely. So this mm-hmm. is published in Nature, nature Medicine. Nature Medicine. Yeah. And that's a really big deal. That is is not a headline that we glossed over. We yeah, read this one. to ignore. We read mm-hmm. this one pretty carefully. Yeah, yeah read this one pretty mm-hmm. carefully. The article mm-hmm. is not the study itself. The article is news interpretation of the article's findings. Yeah. What do the researchers do in this study? They analyze blood samples from just over a thousand participants and they found multiple compounds linked to cardiovascular risk. However, erythritol had some of the strongest links to the risk of cardiovascular events. They also found that participants in the US and European cohorts with the highest 25 percentile erythritol blood levels were 2.5 and 4.5 times more likely to have a cardiovascular event than those in the lowest 25 percentile. Basically consume erythritol mm-hmm. more consistently and therefore yeah. have a higher volume of it, level of it in your yeah. blood. You're more at at risk increased risk of cardiovascular of events. The blood clotting as well, right? mm. which is connected, of course, yeah. to lots of different things, not just cardiovascular. But if you consume or you had a higher level of erythritol, mm-hmm. you were more likely to clot. That's in your right. Blood. This is my hot take. Yeah. Does anyone eating artificial sweetener really think that there's no cost to pay? My hot take. <laughs> surely you were don't, consuming... Don't take my Coke Zero away. <laughs> surely you were consuming this realizing... You mm. have to pay the piper at some point. Mm-hmm. That's my hot take. Okay. I know it's billed as being very safe, but how mm. can it just taste sweet but have no calories and have no you're other suspi- effect? You're a suspicious person. Yeah, like I'll take the calories sometimes, you know? Can't this be a modern miracle? Apparently <laughs> it's not, although yeah. this study is not confirmation of mm. A death sentence for artificial sweeteners and all that food. No, it's more of a warning. Studies they've done are concerning. Mm. And so they're saying here, through multiple tests, they found that increased erythritol levels indicated higher rates of clot formation and increased thrombosis potential. Neither of those things are good for people consuming it, nor mm-hmm. the makers of mm-hmm. artificial sweeteners. This is a specific type of artificial sweetener, erythritol. But That's right. I'd be surprised if this kind of similar finding won't happen next with other artificial sweeteners. Yeah, that's. I'd like to look at the paper in more detail to see what the other compounds they looked at were, if they were other artificial sweeteners or why erythritol in particular. There are other common ones. And the mm. researchers did concede that the conclusion of the paper was not that artificial sweeteners are globally bad, mm-hmm. but that this kind of study needs to happen 
more frequently That's to right. get more long-term mm-hmm. data on mm-hmm. this because yeah it's very much a part of people's lives you know a lot of people yeah, drink and something that a lot know, of artificial sweeteners people and... are very undecided about whether it's okay for them to have or not there's been a lot of different research out there some i remember a while back i think it was suggesting that regularly consuming these compounds increase like your craving eating sweet things there's a lot of back and forth in the research about whether it's good or bad or okay and this seems to have been mm. the most definitive piece of work so far That's right. that firmly puts it in the negative camp in a yeah. really high profile job. Mm, absolutely if you are not in this area mm. and you read headlines like this all the mm-hmm. time about hey someone else told me the thing i like is really deadly or gives me cancer and a lot of these could be students mm-hmm. or students trying to talk about this to their parents because mm-hmm. right? i think that's another responsibility I, I teach a lot of science students and even if they don't go on and become research scientists i tell them look you do have a bit of responsibility here because you're learning about this at a level that most people like 95 percent of people never Mm. approach Mm -hmm. so you do have to then go out there into the community and talk about it at the very least with your friends and family absolutely and scientific issues are becoming more and more prevalent Mm -hmm. in our everyday lives you can't really ignore it anymore no not at all my advice to them when they look at any kind of headline around this thing you liked is now bad Mm -hmm. this thing you like causes cancer the summary of the title yeah yeah Mm -hmm. this thing you love is going to kill you try and pass through its significance because Mm -hmm. there are a few telltale signs if it's really something you should pay attention to Mm -hmm. versus something that is probably a risk factor for a sub portion Mm -hmm. of the population Mm -hmm. but as long as you're not doing it to the extremes Mm -hmm. you're you're probably not going to be affected too much either way and the first one is we already talked about is how prestigious the journal is Mm. that the article the original research was published it's not an indicator 100% of the time but it does give us an idea of how trusted the research can be because of how rigorous the review process would have been I have colleagues who routinely publish in nature they tell me that back and forth submitting the paper easily what 10 times so many times yeah easily every mm-hmm. time they ask mm-hmm. for a lot more work and mm-hmm. it could be two three years yeah. from initial point of submission and this is you know through a, a process used by journals called peer review yes which is where experts in the field give feedback ask questions mm. basically want to test the validity of the claims that are made if you do one or two rounds of back and forth mm-hmm. with reviewers that's usually enough mm-hmm. otherwise they reject you outright that's kind yeah. of been my experience but these journals they really want every time to back and for That's so right. many times and mm-hmm. each time they want so many more experiments to mm-hmm. be done it's not worth it but in this case if it's a big enough and important enough finding it's in this paper it's worth doing so anyway this journal nature suite of publications is very very significant so mm-hmm. that's not the thing that's going to give it away all right the next thing you look at other than the outlet that was published in is how many people was the study looking at that's and right. in this case it was over 2,000 participants they looked at thousands mm. very broadly i think that's good If it was hundreds, you'd be a little bit more concerned. That's right. I'd be more comfortable with tens of thousands Mm -hmm. from multiple countries. But it seems like they dabbled it from the United States and Europe. So, yeah, it is multiple countries. Yep, so different sort of genetic backgrounds, which is important. So that's Mm -hmm. good. Not a red flag in this case Mm -hmm. either. And look at me critiquing a nature paper. You don't need me to critique a nature paper. It's clearly been through vetting. But I'm just trying to walk through the the logical process. that you would look at. So filter. Mm -hmm. So so I don't think the sample size is a Mm -hmm. red flag for any Mm -hmm. point of concern. Then you want to see what kind of data they're analyzing i don't recommend looking at data presented in nature journals unless you're kind of in the field because it will look really opaque you'll see crazy yeah. graphs you'll mm-hmm. see lots of different plots mm-hmm. and you'll see statistical tests so i don't recommend the graphs but i recommend looking through the methods section to yep. see what kind of work actually was done mm-hmm. when they looked at thousands of participants mm-hmm. and they were trying to do statistical comparisons to check if there was a connection between one factor being high and another yeah. factor being high that's right and you'd want to be careful with something like this because obviously cardiovascular risk would be multifactorial Mm -hmm. so there'd be a lot of different things you'd need to take into consideration in a study like this and the authors do consider a limitation Mm -hmm. is that there could be other confounders that's right other variables that didn't control and it's tricky so they're adjusting risk based on age smoking status blood pressure cholesterol levels etc and conceding that it's possible that unmeasured confounders may be present such as diet which could have affected the results probably did their best to control for it Mm. but across a few thousand people Mm. you may have missed a confounder Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. is going to bias the results not to mention even choosing several thousand people from a few different countries there will inevitably be confirmation bias Mm -hmm. it won't be a purely neutral recruitment process it just can't be Mm -hmm. people do have to volunteer for Mm -hmm. it at some level so it may be people who are more worried about it or maybe people who saw it and thought it would be relevant so Mm -hmm. there are these social Mm -hmm. cognitive psychological factors that these studies typically don't control for no it's hard to delve into it 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 may be Mm -hmm. impossible to do that it's just saying this 
kind of study needs to continue to get yeah, more data. Right. This kind of population-wide analysis, very rarely is it what we call causal. Very rarely can it pinpoint one mm -hmm. thing will definitely cause the other. Erythritol will definitely cause cardiac arrest or mm. cardiac disease or blood clotting. It just, if you consume erythritol by this much more, then your risk of the other thing will go up by this mm. much more. But it's an association. A correlation. That's mm. right. One thing goes up, the other goes mm -hmm. up, or one thing goes down, the other thing goes down. Mm -hmm. But it's not causal. Mm. For it to be causal, you need to conduct it in a tightly controlled experimental setting, which we call an intervention study. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing you have to be on the lookout for. You can't really do it in an intervention study at scale. Unlikely. Certainly if it's the first kind of study, it's cost too much. It's, it's expensive. It's very expensive. It's like a full-blown mm. clinical trial at that yeah. point, right? Expensive. So then you do need the population-wide study that mm -hmm. really can't give you the causal connection. So they've got that piece of it in this mm -hmm. paper. And then you need the intervention study mm -hmm. where they give people the thing that yeah. is supposed to increase the other thing yep, and then say hey what happens and so in this case they did do an intervention study so mm -hmm. again we're not looking at the graphs and the figures unless you really know a lot about this kind of stuff you're reading the methods section and seeing what kind of methods they actually used mm. in this case they did do both a population wide mm -hmm. analysis mm -hmm. as well as an intervention study now how many people was the question was involved in the intervention study eight Hmm. Eight people. What yeah. did they make these people do? They gave so, them the erythritol. In a prospective pilot intervention study, and it's got a an ID here, it's a link to a clinical trials database or oh. registry where you can actually click on this link and have a look at the details of the trial, which okay. is very interesting. So yeah. this is a clinical trial. Probably. Yeah, you could click on this link and have a look at the study itself, which is something that people might want to do. So they're saying that erythritol ingestion in healthy volunteers, number is eight, induced marked and sustained more than two days of increases in plasma erythritol levels well above thresholds associated with heightened platelet reactivity and thrombosis potential in vitro and in in vivo studies so they did take it to the next level that's right and reproduce the observation mm -hmm. under a causal connection mm -hmm. within the tightly controlled group yeah. and they didn't register with the clinical trials yeah. which I wouldn't expect anything less mm -hmm. at this kind of level of publication yeah. but it's an a people yeah right it's that's an, right. An, an mm. that's the one thing that mm -hmm. often is is the caveat in this kind of stuff mm. because with eight people all of those issues that affected the thousand people group yeah. of possible confounders and mm -hmm. confirmation bias mm -hmm. and choosing people that were already at risk of this kind yeah. of stuff that's of course magnified and amplified in yeah so they've just called it a prospective pilot intervention study so it's a small scale yes interventional study here yes. based on this it's not enough to throw out mm. all of the diet coke or whatever mm. diet soda or steve your artificial sweetener you have in your not pantry that yet. Mm -hmm. but it's cause for alarm mm -hmm. And again, I come back to my hot take. Were you really consuming it thinking there would be no price to pay at some point, right? You're too suspicious. There should be punishment for enjoyment. There should be a trade-off. When you're enjoying something, that you should know something bad is coming. Some point. There's got to be a trade-off, right? And this may be the trade-off. It may not be. If you were consuming a lot of artificial sweetener, consider reducing it perhaps. But... I think keeping an eye out for it is a good thing too. And I think this will be a watch this space because I imagine that they're taking this to the next level trial, probably having a look at more participants, longer term study, probably to see what happens. Long right. Term. Mm. And best case scenario, it would mm. be enough to alert the people making artificial sweetener yeah. and double down on the investment and mm -hmm. finding the part of it that mm -hmm. is contributing to this risk and hopefully engineering a better version yeah. of it, a sweet, <laughs> sweet flavor without the risk of any of these diseases. So hopefully this spurs on more so innovation. It's not Stevie, I'm not a fan. Not a fan yeah. of Stevia. Yeah, we're, we're not sponsored disgusting. by Stevia, but no. if we were, you just ruin any chances of us getting Sorry, that sponsor for the future. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bats. That brings us to the end of yet another episode of Crossover mm. Connections. We'll learn about global market forces and all of these drug companies, as well as always keep an eye out on artificial intelligence, AI, and those dirty, dirty bats with their incredible immune systems and frustratingly mobile and agile Damn, those fitness bats. regimes. Those bats just get more infuriating <laughs> with every article they we read. They make me even more angry. If you've been watching along on YouTube, thanks for following along as well as on the podcast platforms mm -hmm. you can find us on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher really anywhere you find your podcast thank you for listening this is episode four of the crossover connections podcast i'm jack and i'm amanda hope to connect with you again this time around in the next episode